opportunity to be here today and get into this blessed book a bit. We'll continue our study on uh, pre-tribulation rapture. And uh, let's, let's open up in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name now, Lord, I pray that you'd help me this day to, uh, to teach your word, Father. Give me the gift of teaching. Grant me utterance in the Holy Ghost, Lord. Father, give me understanding and wisdom in the Scriptures. And Lord, we pray for the, the service that's to come. I pray for those that are still making their way here this morning, that you watch over them, keep them safe. Bring them to us, Lord. I pray for your presence, your power in the preaching services and in the singing that we're going to have today. And Lord, I pray that you fill me with the Holy Ghost. Prepare me for the trip to Haiti next week. God, uh, I, I just I pray that you have got prepared hearts there and, and that you give me the message that, that's needful, Father, and help me to be faithful to preach it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we've been studying about the uh, pre-tribulation rapture, and we've been looking a lot at uh, the people who oppose it. You know, and uh, I had a guy call me on something. He told me I was lying about uh, what I said about Zach Poonin's doctrine about the uh, uh, what is it that that there's only one resurrection period and that it's at the last day, you know, and he uses Matthew 24 uh, to prove that. And, uh, you know, and I told you last week, well, that's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, one resurrection and it comes on the last day. And I just wanted to say it here now that I will supply the links so that you can compare on, on, the, on the internet. I'll supply the links in the video description box so that you can look it up and you can hear with your own ears, read with your own eyes uh, and see the things that I'm not making this stuff up, man. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. It's, it's the truth. It's the truth. Now, we've been, like I said, looking at the objections and, and, and at, at where they're coming from, why they teach what they teach. And I hope that it's becoming abundantly clear to everybody who's been uh, following this and attending the classes and stuff that it's all a matter of where you put Israel in God's prophetic program. I've said it before and I'll say it a thousand more times, hopefully, before I die. If you don't get the Jew right, you cannot properly divide the Word of God in prophecy. The idea is that God's all through with the Jews. There will be a small rem a believing remnant at the second advent, but because the church, in the view of on postmillennialism, has taken the place of Israel, then all of the things that were written uh, uh, concerning Israel and God's promises with them, the, the covenants he made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and uh, all the people in the Old Testament, no longer apply to physical, literal Israel, but they all apply to the church. And uh, it's a funny thing that they want the promises, but, buddy, nobody wants those curses that go with it. Amen? But there's some of these guys who... Uh, and particularly, this is one of the things that I've run into, is people who like to talk tough, you know. Oh, that's a coward's way out. You hope you'll get raptured so you won't have to suffer for the Lord. I'm willing to die for him. Now, I've known some people who said that before. First one comes to mind is Peter. That's right. He said, I'll die for you. I'll die for you. And he turned around and he was just as chicken as that rooster that was crowing, wasn't he? Amen. Amen. And uh, on a more personal basis, I've got a guy who I used to go to church with. Brother Mike, you know him pretty well. I won't use his name here. But uh, I remember having a discussion with him. We were talking about the tribulation period, book of Revelation, all this stuff. been 30 years, I guess. Maybe longer ago. And uh, 
we were talking about persecution, and I said, well, brother, you know, I mean, I, I don't know what I would do in that situation. I'll just be honest with you. I like to think that, uh, that, that I'd be bold in my stand and that I would just willingly lay my life down and all that, but, but and knowing people like I do, uh, I don't know what I'd do. It'd take the grace of God to be able to do that. Well, this rascal turns right around and says, there ain't no doubt in my mind I'd die for him. If they come into the church tonight with a gun, I'd put my forehead right against the barrel and tell them, go ahead and shoot me. I don't care. I'm ready to go to heaven. Well, that rascal ain't been to church in 30 years. Yep. Amen. He denies all the stuff he used to teach and preach, yep. but he'd die for him. He'd die for him. You know, that is that is just a boastful, arrogant statement to make. The, the, it is the flesh. That's it exactly. It's pride. It's pride. I'd do this. I'd do that. I'd do the other. I can endure to the end. Well, what? What good is dying for him if you won't live for him? Yeah, amen. Yeah, why die for him? He don't want you to die for him. Ed Ballou said, well, honey, he don't want you to die for him. He wants you to live for him. <laughs> and that's right, brother. We should not live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lust of the flesh, but unto God yeah, is what Peter said. And that's what we ought to do. But, but these guys have got an idea that somehow they're going to, I don't know, I guess they think they're going to write some additional uh, books to the Bible or something where that they will be uh, the hero in them. <laughs> Well, a lot of heroes in the Bible failed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It failed time and time again. And, and I got a suspicion that a lot of them will fail too. Now, I know that if, if you know, I've talked to you about this guy, Mansour Muhammad, the Somali Christian who was martyred uh, uh, for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He got saved in 2005. He was working for a... Uh, a, a missions group over there, and they were going to take a medical supplies and food to the surrounding villages in Somali. And while they're making one of their trips, uh, a bunch of the, uh, the rebels, uh, has, who are they over in Somalia? I can't think. Uh, El Shabazz is who they are. El Shabazz uh, rebels, they came down, they captured them. And they took that man, and they stood there blah, 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 doing all that junk and hollering, and this guy's got a scroll, and he's reading the charges off against him. And while he's reading them, two of them got him. His hands are tied behind his back. And one of them had one of those Rambo-like knives with the, the teeth on the back side of the blade, and he's running it through his hair, messing with him, messing with him, messing with him. And after that guy got through... Uh, uh, reading the charges against him, they took and kicked him down on his stomach, and a guy got on his back, grabbed his forehead, and cut his head off. Well, uh, Mansoor, he did not whimper. He didn't struggle. He was praying. You could see that he was praying. See his lips moving. And I guarantee you that he didn't wake up that morning thinking, I can go and die for Jesus today. You know what happened? When he got in that position, God filled him with the Holy Ghost, Amen. just like Stephen, and gave him a vision of what's on the other side. Amen. But the Bible tells us that God resisteth the proud giveth and giveth Amen. grace to the humble. Amen. And I've got a a sneaking suspicion that a lot of these tough guys are going to be crying for mama if they ever get put in that position. And a lot of people who you'd never suspect would, would have what it took to do that will find it because they'll realize what Paul said, that when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. And it'll be God doing the work in them. God got a way. I, I'd be awful careful about any boast that I make. Now, God's got a way of putting you to the test, trying your faith. And uh, he, not because he's being mean or anything like that. He just wants you to know where you're at. Amen. He already knows. He, it ain't a mystery to him. Amen. You know, the Bible says he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Yeah. 
And that's what you are, man. If you run around talking like that, mm -mm -mm. you're a fool. You don't know what you'll do till you get put in that situation. Right. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse 50. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here, and then we're going to look at some things. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, and uh, starting in verse 50, the Apostle Paul said, now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on an immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O grave, where is thy sting? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, the word that I want to call your attention to here is in verse number 51. That's the word mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. Well, we just looked it up in, uh, in Daniel Webster's 1868, what, huh? 1828 dictionary. But, you know, I like to use the older ones because they're closer to the, the actual definitions of the words that the translators used uh, who did the King James Bible. And it defines a mystery as, you know, it's a secret. It's something that's hitherto unknown. It's something that's not been revealed yet. Well, you got a problem if the rapture's a mystery, but the rapture and the resurrection are one and the same event, as these post-tribulationists teach. Because if you look in the Word of God, it becomes really, really, really clear that the resurrection wasn't a mystery. Amen. Go back to Job. They say that the book of Job predates Abraham, predates uh, Moses, predates all these guys. And in the book of Job, in chapter 14, verse number, or 15, 14, in verse number 14, Job said, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Yeah. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thy hands. See, Job knew. Job knew that there would be a resurrection of the dead. Job knew that every work would be called into judgment and that the righteous would enter into the pleasures forevermore and that the ungodly would go to hell. He knew that quite clearly. Again, in Job chapter number 19, Job wrote these words, or these words are pinned down that he said, starting in verse number 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold. Not another, though my reins be consumed within me. See, Job, right here, is talking about something that was common knowledge throughout the Old Testament. Amen. He's talking about the resurrection yep. of the body. Amen. It's not a mystery. The rapture is a mystery. Yep. It's a mystery. The church was a mystery. The idea that Jew and Gentile would be one body in Christ Jesus our Lord was a mystery. It was something that was not revealed. People don't understand the fact that, that Peter got a hold of. Over here, let me find this real quick. In 1 Peter uh, chapter number 1, 
starting in verse 10, he said, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that had preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Did you know that Christ in you, the hope of glory, was a mystery to the angels? <laughs> Did you know that even Isaiah, when he pinned down Isaiah, what is chapter number 53, where it talks about his visions would marred more than any man, how that he's wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. Isaiah didn't know what that meant. Amen. He simply wrote what God gave him. And the Bible says clearly that it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported to you. They wrote a lot of stuff that they didn't have a clue about. If they'd been like many people today and had to be able to reason it all out and, and, and uh, be able to logically uh, place it and categorize it into one of their little pigeonholes, the Old Testament would be a very short book indeed because it's full of things that were way beyond the scope of experience and knowledge possessed by the men of those days. But one of the things that they did know, and they knew it with great certainty, was that there would be a resurrection. There would be a resurrection. David wrote of it in Psalm chapter number 17 and verse 15. He wrote these words. He said, uh, as for me, I will behold thy faith in right, face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. David expected to wake up and to see God and said, I'll be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Amen. He knew a change was going to come. Amen. He understood it perfectly well. He knew exactly uh, what the promise was that God had given and revealed at that time that there would be a resurrection of the dead. Again, in, uh, let's go to John chapter 11. Everybody's familiar with this? This is the case of Lazarus. In John chapter number 11. Yeah, start in verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall live again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again at the rapture. <laughs> no. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Well, she believed it. She also believed that there would be a resurrection at the last day. Amen. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15? He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. Something that's already been revealed, something that's already known, something that's a common expectation of God's people throughout a thousand or two, three thousand years is not a mystery. Amen. Paul was talking about a mystery, another event, a separate event that was to take place. Again, it's Psalm chapter number 89 and verse 48. Psalm 89, verse number 48. psalmist writes what man is he that liveth and shall not see death shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave why that's what the rapture is is the fact that a man will live and not see death there's a generation that is going to be the most fortunate generation in the history of mankind we're going to cheat death. 
We're going to cheat death. What did it say over here in Thessalonians? Let's look at the description. First Thessalonians. In chapter number 4. Uh, starting in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Look at what he said here. He said that, that uh, you're going to hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, who do you think is blowing God's trumpet. The trump of God. Huh? That's God. That's God. They say, well, see, that's the last trump. That's the last trump. Well, let's look over here at the last trump in the book of Revelations. There's the vials. The seventh trumpet sounded. And the seventh angel sounded. Chapter, and chapter number 11 and verse 15. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. The seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The seventh angel sounded. That's not the trump of God. That's, that's the angel's trump. The trump of God, it would seem to me, the trump of God will be a trump that God himself makes. That he will call. That he will say, come up hither. That he'll blow the trump. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Compare that with Matthew 25 when it's talking about the second advent. Nobody's going up. Nobody's going up there. The Lord Jesus is coming back to the earth, and He's having a judgment that takes place. A judgment that takes place there. And what will happen at that judgment is all the Old Testament saints will be resurrected all of the tribulation period saints will be resurrected who have lost their lives and they will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and be judged according to the criteria that's given in Matthew chapter 25. The church is nowhere in sight there. It's not us. The Old Testament saints aren't in the church. Tribulation saints are not in the church. Amen. They're separate things. Things that are different are not the same. Things that are different are not the same. Look, look over here in uh, Matthew chapter 27. Let me show you something. Oh, the first fruits. That's something that they like to, to talk about. Christ the first fruits in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm flying by the seat of my pants. I got jammed up this morning. Couldn't get anything printed out. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, back over here. And uh, let's start in, in uh, verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. But we see the order of the resurrection here. Christ, the first fruits, and those that are Christ at his coming. Okay, they say, well, 
the post-tribulation guys that I was referring to and reading their material, all of them said uh, without any doubt that Christ is the only first fruit that's referred to in that passage. So I'm like, well, let's look and see if there are any more first fruits mentioned in the Word of God. Christ the first fruits. First Corinthians, uh, let's see, where do I want to go now? I want to go to... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 15. You don't have to go far. 1 Corinthians 16, 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So right there, we find some first fruits. Some first fruits. Then you go on down to uh, go to the book of James, chapter 1 and verse number 18. In James 1.18, James is writing and says, Of his own will, he, God, begat us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Amen. Now, I want you to think about that. The Lord Jesus Christ is uniquely the only begotten Son of God. Amen. The only begotten Son of God. And He is also the firstborn from the grave. The firstborn from the dead. He's the first to rise from the dead never to die again. Amen. Never to die again. And if He's the first, then it just stands to reason that there's going to be others that follow. Man. <laughs> if he's the only one, then they'd say he's the only one. The first fruit. It says first fruits. See, we are in him. We are joined to the Lord in such an intimate way that in 1 Corinthians, where is this? Let me find this. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Let's read for a minute. Uh, start in verse 7. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud and that your brethren. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me. And this is the train really runs off the tracks on that verse right there, buddy. They say that that means that sodomy is lawful to you, that drunkenness is lawful to you, that robbing banks is lawful to you, that murdering people is lawful to you. All things are lawful to me. But that's not, he's just started to change the subject when he says that. Verse 12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. He doesn't say fornications for the body. He says meats for the belly. He's talking about dietary restrictions here. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He just made it very clear that if it regards meat, and he goes on later on in this book, and he's talking about eating things that have been offered to idols. He said, don't ask. If you go, you're go, you a guest in somebody's house, and they set something before you, don't ask where it came from for conscience sake. Because what they do is they'd go, they'd have their sacrifices, and they'd turn around and sell the meat to the public, and they'd take it home and eat it. He said, don't ask. If you've got a weaker brother with you, don't ask. Don't offend his conscience. Just go ahead, don't ask any questions, bow your head, thank God for it, and enjoy it. Don't worry about it. The idol's nothing. 
The idol's nothing. Well, that's what he's talking about here when he says, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. Meat, see, meat, all things are lawful. Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication. See, now he's contrasting it. He said fornicators won't inherit the kingdom of God. He goes down here and he just said all things are lawful. And then he clarifies by saying the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath uh, both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. And this is the verse I wanted to get. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Brother, we're in him. We're in him. We're in him. The life that we live is no longer the life that we inherited from Daddy Adam. You remember Adam was formed of the dust of the ground and said that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. The life that Adam received was the very life of God himself. That's the life that he lost. When they ate of the forbidden fruit, when death passed upon men, when sin entered into the world. Amen. And that life of God that was lost in Adam has been restored in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It says in Ephesians that we're alienated from the life of God which is in Christ Jesus. But that life, thank God, that eternal life, that's what we receive when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that sense, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Because we no longer walk according to the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. As it says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 2, or 2, 2 I believe it is. We're living by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. The very spirit of God himself is our source of life. And that's why he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. If you can find a place where God dies, then you can die if you're a Christian. But you'll never die. Your body is asleep. Well, he said in uh, 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 First uh, Thessalonians chapter number 4, them that sleep, them that sleep, in 1 Corinthians 15, referring to Christians who had uh, run their race and their bodies were in the grave, he said they sleep. They sleep. They're not dead. Their body is just, is just it's been tucked away and stored away until the rapture takes place. And then that body will be raised up. And that eternal life that we never cease to live, we'll, 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 the body comes up, we come down, they're rejoined together. And brother, our salvation is complete and full. We've got the redemption of the body. Our adoption has taken place. He that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit, is what he says right here. And therefore, I'm confident when I say this, when it says Christ the first fruits, that that is a reference to every child of God who is born again through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I got no doubt about that whatsoever. Amen. None whatsoever. And uh, I just, you know, like I've said before, I don't understand how people can read the same Bible that we read and come out with such different... Well, I do understand it. I do understand, actually. It ain't a pleasant thing to know, but I, I know why. You see, a lot of the guys... Okay, the source, the source, the absolute source of, uh, of the doctrine of amillennialism and postmillennialism... Uh, and 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 the pre-trib and the post-trib uh, rapture positions, they got one common source, and that is men who studied the writings of Greek philosophers and then took and applied that to their interpretation of the scriptures. That's exactly what Augustine did. That's exactly what Origen did. The school of Alexandria in Egypt was full of men who did that. I told you before that, that uh, 
uh, Augustine, he was a professor of rhetoric. And rhetoric is defined in the dictionary as inflated arguments uh, used to prove a point. It's when you exaggerate things. And uh, Augustine himself in his writing uh, boasted about what he had learned uh, from philosophers and said that it was only good and right that he take what they uh, had taken unlawfully away from them and use it to define the Word of God. So what he's doing is he's taking things that he learned from pagan philosophers, from sodomites and drunkards and, and, and everything else you can think of under the sun. He's taking the writings of these pagan men and then applying it to Scripture in order to develop a theology. And the theology is going to end up being wrong every time. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, uh, because it's impossible. They, they have to be spiritually understood. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual is what it says in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 2.13. Scripture with Scripture, Scripture with Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's the way that you learn the Word of God. Now, the point that I'm trying to make today is this. The, it's really simple. The rapture's a mystery. It's a mystery. It wasn't revealed until Paul came along. And God revealed it to Paul, and he's the one who wrote about it. Amen. The only one who wrote about it. The resurrection was a matter of common knowledge. Amen. All the way from Job uh, up until uh, the Lord Jesus came along. The resurrection's not a mystery. The church is going to be the subject of the rapture. We've already looked and seen how that, how that, uh, the, what, the, what the nature and the purpose of the tribulation period is. Look back here real quickly. I've just got a couple of minutes left, but. Let's see here. Book of Joel. Chapter number two. Blow you the, verse one. Blow you the trumpet in Zion. And sound an alarm. My holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord. The day of Jehovah. Cometh. For it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. That's what it is. It's not, it's not the blessed hope. It's not the blessed hope. Last chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 here. Let's see. Verse number 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. That's not the blessed hope. That's not the blessed hope. That sounds a little bit more to me like uh, the book of Titus back here. Where Paul writes to Titus and tells him. In verse, in chapter number... Uh, is that right? No, it's not Titus. Sorry about that, gentlemen. Is it First Timothy? Nope. It's Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Uh, starting in verse seven. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be. Revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Remember what we read over here in Isaiah 66, 15. For the Lord, that's all capitals. For Jehovah will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger and his fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Well, in uh, 2 Thessalonians, Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost said in verse 7 of chapter 1, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, 
that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Jude 14. Hmm? Jude yeah, Jude, Jude 14. Read that for me, brother. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of His saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all, that are ungodly among all, among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches and ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. Amen. Isaiah, how about Psalm chapter 15, starting at verse 1, says, The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken, Jehovah has spoken, and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempted tempestuous round about him he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people not gather them judge his people gather my saints together unto me those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice who's that that's israel that's israel we have not the church has not made a covenant together with the lord by sacrifice he's talking about abraham when he got, made that covenant with him and abraham set up that altar and he made that sacrifice it's talking about abraham when he took his son up on the mountain to offer him up as a sacrifice when god enjoined him with an everlasting covenant that's who he's talking about, calling the, his people, the Jews, gather my saints together unto me, that th those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. Even at the second advent, when God comes to establish the messianic kingdom, when he comes to set up the kingdom promised to David, he says that I come to judge. I'm coming to judge you. Amen. And then he's going to purge the rebels out, it says in the book of Ezekiel. With a rod of iron, I make them pass under the rod. Jesus is the one who rules with a rod of iron in Revelation chapter number 12. That's not what the rapture is. The rapture is the blessed hope of the church. Amen. It's where we are called up into heaven to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. While we're in heaven, the, the uh, judgment seat of Christ will take place. The, uh, uh, the rewards will be passed out. We'll be singing, praising God, and glorifying Him. And it'll seem like but a moment in time while the seven years of pure hell is breaking out on this earth. Amen. And then... Then, finally, Revelation chapter 19, where he who is holy and true, righteous and true, mounts up on that horse, and we're going to come back with him. Amen. And we're just going to be along for the ride because he don't need no help. No. <laughs> a lot of these post-trib uh, guys, they talk like God is having a, a battle with the devil. Like the devil is such a powerful adversary that they've got a, God's got to fight him tooth and nail. Let, let me tell you something, man. God could simply say the word and there'd be no more Satan. Amen. But God has a plan for the ages. And that plan involves uh, men and women, boys and girls. It involves in particular a nation called Israel. Yep. And, and, and God is so merciful that he even made provision for the Gentiles to get in that thing through his son. Through his son. Amen. Things that are different, not the same. Rapture and, and, the, and the resurrection are not the same. The idea that there is one general resurrection and, and then when Jesus is on the throne of his glory in Matthew 25, that that's the final judgment is absurd. It's wrong. It's wrong. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, thank you for this day. And I pray, my God, that that you will help and empower the preaching that's to come, Father. Lord God, let everything that's done here be done to lift up the name of thy blessed Son, in whose name I pray. Amen. Amen.